Um, I was an enlisted man uh, in the Marine Corps in 1941 before Pearl Harbor. And uh, after Pearl Harbor came, all hell broke loose and the recruits, everybody wanted to join the Army and the Marines and the Navy to help because we were one nation, undivided. And so uh, as a result of about six weeks training, they made me uh, a drill instructor. They put uh, corporal stripes on my arm. No, didn't, I wasn't really a corporal, but to, to give me a little authority. And so I was out there giving them, you know, left, right, left, right, doing all that things. And one day I said to the major after about two months of this, I didn't join the Marine Corps to be a drill instructor. I want to go to war. You know, he said, what did you do in civilian life? I said, I was a file clerk. He said, you were, come with me. Here's a desk piled high with papers. You've learned, make some sense out of this. So as a result, I was there a couple of months and every day all the letters came in uh, from the congressman, you have somebody on your command, be sure you treat them all right. And we really treated those guys all right. But any, any, anyhow, uh, one letter came through and said, we need pilots desperately down at Guadalcanal. Do you have anybody under your command? Uh, that you could recommend. So I took the letter to the colonel and I said, how about recommending me? He said, write your own letter and I'll sign it. He did and I was off. And I ended up being a, a pilot, uh, a fighter pilot flying the F4U off uh, the carrier wasp. And I was in the invasion of Guam, the invasion of Saipan, the invasion of Iwo Jima, the invasion of Okinawa where they shot me down, the invasion of Tokyo. We were the first eight Marines going into Tokyo we're leading a flight of about 50 planes. Uh, some were uh, TBFs, some were uh, SB2Cs, uh, dive bombers. And uh, so we were the first eight come in and all, they knew we were coming. If you've ever been to Tokyo, we went in on the water, tried to keep under radar, but they knew we were, then we climbed the hills and then we come down, we come down in the harbor, the Zeros were parked in the runways. And so we were firing at them and they were firing like mad back at us. And of the eight going in, they killed three of us. But what we did then, after, after we make this run down, we got right down on the water and all the machine guns were up in the hill and they couldn't shoot down. And so we, we escaped out and went down like this. And then we went back to try to meet the carrier. Yeah. And back in those days, it was quite crude. You pulled out a little chalkboard and you said, we're going 320 miles an hour or 320 knots at this angle we go out here and the carrier is going to 22 knots here so we should meet them out here and it was snowing like mad it was in um, February yeah February of 1945 snowing like mad so we get out the carrier no carrier just ocean radio silence but what they did is uh, they had had, we found out later, they had a submarine scare and turned around and was 100 miles away. But you see, they weren't about to sacrifice 3,000 men on the carrier for a handful of pilots. So uh, what they did, they before we take off, they issue a pie chart uh, with 16, it's one of the A, L, C, whatever it is, all the way around. And every minute they go, but you listen, listen, another minute you hear, but we talk among, we we're talking with each other. So that sounds like an A. So we look at the A chart. We followed the A chart. Pretty soon it went into L. Oh, L, we've gone too far. We can back see. So we bracketed back and forth like this. And all of a sudden, snowstorm, out of gas, there was a carrier. And boy, you better make it that first pass. Because we were, we were empty. So we come in, we landed, got in okay. And they wanted to interrogate us, find out what happened, you know, and uh, what damage they did, what we saw, and they gave us a shower and fed us. And then they sent us back. The second time, we kind of knew what we were going to get into. See, the first time, wow, we were all excited, you know. So then they sent us back, but they sent us to a different target. Uh, it wasn't Nagasaki, but it was over in that area. So, so. The, Sure enough, we got over there, we all have a 500 pound bomb, and there's about 16 of us. And we got to the airfield, sitting ducks, there were rows of airplanes. Wow, we're gonna really get them. So we, we 
We dived down and the machine guns going, let our bombs go and pulled out of there. Well, there was a, a reconnaissance plane that followed us and took pictures of the damage. They told us later there wasn't a plane there, they're all painted on the runway. So, <laughs> so that's so the uh, second time there was no no well, we come over firing into the hangars, there was a little put putt at us, but there was no heavy firepower the second time through. But that, that night, I'll tell you, I got Charlie horses in both in both legs, because I must have been had both feet pushing, you know. I wasn't very relaxed after those two runs. <laughs> so it, my legs kind of pulled up on me that night. So, but anyhow, then uh, there we went down to Okinawa, and uh, these are all before the invasions. We softened them up. We softened them up, and uh, we fire, and they fire back. We fire at the gun positions, like in uh, in Sai, uh, Saipan, a lot of cliffs. They're all dug in the cliffs. We come right on the water. We came right on the water, and firing at them, and they're firing at us. But you could only get so close because you had to pull up because of the cliff, see? And so you don't know what damage you did. You fire, fire at their, their gun positions. In Okinawa, when we, we dropped our bomb to the ship in the harbor, we weren't dive bombers. We were try to keep from slipping. I know I made a nice big plume right alongside the ship. But <laughs> and, uh, and I was the last one in the bunch. And, and the guy circled right over the gun position. And they were firing at us. And all of a sudden I got hit, and down I went tumbling, and all of a sudden I got control of it, and it was the concussion right next to my ship. Okay, Dab 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 <laughs> <laughs> Right, we've all seen the classic black and whites of the Corsair yeah. hitting the cliffs and seeing the yeah. and all that stuff. You were there. Yeah, I was there. I was there, and one time, uh, and. You know, it depends. Claude, you're shoot, you're flying number four position. You're in number sixteen position, or whatever it is, whatever the planes are lined up. One day, he said, "You're flying the mission. Go out and look for somebody. See if you got anybody coming in to Guam." So, and the we were had our, our um, we were on the airfield, had about half of Guam, and the front lines was about half up there. They're still firing the Japanese. A lot of dead bodies laying around. So anyhow. We were flying up there, flying this course there, and all of a sudden I said, Bandit, tally ho, 11 o'clock. And I started going, and they followed me, and they said, We don't see it. I said, You're up at 11, come on. And so I kept giving it full power, never did it. It was an oil spot on my windshield. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I took a razzing on that, of course, you know. <laughs> so, never let you forget that one. No. <laughs> And so, uh, uh, and so, uh, yeah, and so uh, that's how close it could be, one little second, you know, like getting shot down or my you know, firepower. So you never, if you think fireworks, you're right in the middle of it, shooting at you like this and going all around you. Wow, you don't know how I ever got through it. And uh, that, so anyhow, four of us got through, three. I, and the guy behind me and his, but, then, but by then they got the range. See, that's why Joe Foss was successful shooting down so many planes. He knew how to shoot pheasants. He led them, see. They were shooting at us and then they finally learned you shoot ahead of them. But he was a good pheasant crack shot. That's why he shot down so many 26 Japanese planes. So after the war, I knew Joe very well because after the war, after the war, he formed the Air National Guard here in 1946. So we got out in 1945. And, uh, oh, by the way, uh, when you get, I was in the Marine Corps. In order to uh, take naval pilot training, you had to get discharged from the Marine Corps and get into the Navy. Then after the Navy, they said, you want to be in the Marines or, or the Navy? I said, no doubt, I'm going back in the Marines. So I, and then, oh yes, and I was, when I was 18, I was in the Army for one month training. So I have an Army Army serial number, a Marine enlistment serial number, Navy serial number, and a Marine pilot serial number. Then I joined the Guard. So I got six numbers. <laughs> then I, so I, <laughs> but anyhow, after the Guard, after the, uh, after the war, we got to fly the P-51s of Joe Foss. And that's a different plane than this one, and they both have their advantages. This one was 
the Japanese called it the whistling death because when you got a full power going down, they went and they hated us pilots. If they ever caught a pilot, they decapitated us and dragged us through the streets. They, you see, you know, the regular soldiers on the ground, back and forth, but here, they can't do anything about it. You're hit and gone, and they really hated us. So, uh, and you've probably seen pictures in where they uh, abused the, the, the prisoners, too. Yeah. But anyhow, after the war, I flew this P-51 Mustang. That's a sweet plane. Can you tell us about your watch? Huh? Tell oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I have my watch here. It's a government issue watch. Exactly on time. You're perfect right there. Anyhow, when I was on Guam, they said uh, uh, a Japanese Zero got shot down. They said, we're making uh, watch bands, the metalsmiths were. We'll make one for you for your, for your watch. And on the back, they engraved my name, engraved Hone on the back, you know. And so that's one of my keepsakes. And on occasions like this, I wear it. And it, it runs real good. So, <laughs> and, and I got my original Ray-Bans that they issued the color. I got them here. I got the glasses. I got them here. I brought a bunch of mementos along. Jeez. I, I brought my discharge paper. I mean, I brought my, my uh, Navy papers, my Navy. You have it all. I brought it along. As I, as I go through life, I look back at my life and uh, I miss death about four times by an inch. And so nothing bothers me anymore. So uh, I, think, I think of what we did for the country. Back in that, the country was all behind us. And uh, they were all red, white, and blue. And they wanted to... Uh, so we, we feel that we stopped uh, at Henderson Field. We stopped the Japanese. They thought they were the super race and they were going to conquer the world like Hitler was going to conquer the other world over here. And they were in conclusion. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Collusion. <laughs> Collusion. I can't yeah. say the word. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I look back and I think, thank God there was guys like us and Joe Foss that stopped them and pushed them back and pushed them back till they surrendered. And uh, when... Uh, I was in probably six months before the atomic bomb. Then the bombers come in and burn down Tokyo. And then uh, they dropped the bomb on August uh, 9th. I, they dropped the first bomb on Hiroshima. And it was terrible. But they asked them to surrender and they wouldn't surrender. So the next day, they went to drop a bomb on a seaport and it was covered with with clouds, they couldn't see it, so they went to the next town, which happened to be Nagasaki. And they dropped it there. And we had a third bomb ready to go the next day. And that's when they capitulated. Thank God, because if we, you know, like Iwo Jima, we were a month uh, of the Marines capturing Iwo Jima, and we lost 61,000 people, you know, dead plus injured in 30 days. So you can imagine, you go to full fortified Japan, we'd have lost almost a million of our men. So we thank God that uh, Truman had the nerve to do this. He, some no-gooders, I mean, whatever you want to say, they say, oh, they shouldn't have killed all those people, but it's, it, we saved the American lives. Mm -hmm. And so that's, uh, that's how I ended up in my career. Then I, after the war, I sold houses for a living and my real estate license is South Dakota Real Estate License One, which I did for 60 years. <laughs> uh, when, uh, at Guam, the plane, our uh, Corsairs were all lined up in a runway because the next morning we'd take off and look, make sure no Japanese planes were coming in to support the, the war. And so uh, we got in, and, and this is still dark out, and we all line, lined up, lined up with the propellers warming up, when all of a sudden there was an explosion about two doors down from me, it exploded. And didn't know what it was. We never took off, but uh, they could see red oil dripping down. Well, it was blood. A Japanese had crawled underneath the seat with two grenades. And he laid one between the pilot and one on himself. 
and he, he couldn't wait till they take off, I guess, and he let them go. And it blew himself up, and, and the, uh, the shaft that holds the stick, it took all the brunt, and the pilot never got hurt at all. It went off right between his feet. And, and this, this uh, so they looked up there, saw the blood, and then they saw the Japanese up there. They were afraid that he might have booby-trapped himself, so they got a rope around him and finally pulled him down. And I was there, and I think there was pictures in uh, a Legion magazine a few days. I think it was me standing there. I'm not sure, but we all stood and watched him pull those down. And uh, uh, he gave his life for the country, you know, and thought he was really helping. But he, he, if he waited until in the air, of course, who knows what had happened. And so, heard of that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I talk to the high schools nowadays, and uh, I tell them about uh, the Stearmans. You know, the, the, way back when it first started, I sat, I sat in front, uh, and the instructor sat behind. We talked to each other with a rubber hose and a funnel on both ends. Uh, yeah, we had no way to talk. So we'd talk, and he'd tap me, and we'd talk, and then I'd listen, and he'd, that's how we talk. When you land on the carrier, the carrier, you spot it, you come down here, and you slow down to about 150 knots here. As you come around here, you, you come around 100 knots. And then as you come down the wing here, you slow it down to six, uh, 79 knots. Stalling speed is 76 knots. So you're three knots over. And that prop better, you better not cough. You better not, and so you hold it right in that position. And that prop is bringing you around. And the signal officer, he'll say, Give it, give it a little gun, or slow it down, or you're too high, or whatever it is. And if you, and, and if you get right over the end, of, as, as the deck is heaving, you get right over the end of the deck, you'll say cut, and you pull it all, everything, and you flop in there. It's got a hook, and there's, there's six wires across, and it'll catch on the first wire usually. But if it bounces and it tries to, if you miss that, they throw up a barrier, you crash into it. They get the pilot out and push the plane over the side. They don't have time to, time to fix them. But one day, one of my buddies got all shy up. He come back to come in. He radioed in. He says, my hydraulic system's gone. I can't get the wheels down. My machine guns are firing intermittently. And the, and the guy in the wasp, the commander wasp, says, you're not going to follow up my deck, son. The hornet over there about a half a mile. He said, you can come over here, son, I'm clearing the deck for you. He cleared the deck, and he came in and landed there, belly landed, no hook, no nothing. And he belly landed, and they threw up a barrier, and with his guns firing, got him out. Pushed the plane over the side and saved the pilot. But that, his name was L.B. Hubs, L.B. Hubs out of Dalton, Georgia. L.B. I said, how come L.B., what's your little, what's your first name? He said, L.B. Come on, your first name. Well, after all, I found out L.B., the folks couldn't decide what to call him, so the doctor wrote on their little boy. <laughs> and he was a tough breed. He didn't want anybody to know his name was Little Boy. So it was L.B. <laughs> one, one time, you know, war, you're, you're in combat for a day or two, and then it's all boring for a month. Then you're in combat, and then you're boring. We were, we were parked in Ulithi getting gas, and we were sitting there one day, and, and uh, uh, let's see, i got to get this straight. Oh, yeah, uh, Hubs was sitting there. He, <laughs> he was sitting there with his shoes off, sitting in the carrier. He kind of sunned himself. And, uh, no, yeah, no, Baker was sitting there. Baker was sitting there, yeah. And uh, he came along, and Hubs said, those are your shoes? He said, yeah, and he threw them overboard. Well, later that day, mail call came. And so he went to Hubs and said, here, you got a letter from your, from your girl who sent you a letter. He reached for it and he sailed it out over the ocean. He got even right there. <laughs> and then I remember one time we sent, and we'd take silver dollars and skip them and bet on how many, you know, whether, and I, you know, we thought we'd never get out of this thing alive anyhow. And, Boy, many times when I was poor after the war, I sure wish I had some of those silver dollars back. We'd sit, skip them, and skip them till they're all. <laughs> they'd pay us, you know. Uh, they'd pay us in money that was marked Hawaii on it. it wasn't, 
it was regular money, but it's marked away. That's that's what they would mark, they'd print it out, and that's what we got paid in. And we'd lose it in the crap game, or we'd win it back, or whatever it is. <laughs> so, but anyway, you never you thought, you know, we, who wants to be a white-haired old man anyhow, you know? So <laughs> nobody did. We would rather die here. <laughs> now, Okay, uh, I find the P-51 Mustangs, okay? First, I checked out of one. I, go ahead and check it out, fly it around. I checked out, I got upside down, a violent upside down spin. I was spinning down to the ground, upside down, and I finally pulled that thing out. What's the matter with this plane? So I tried another loop. Same thing, got up there, violent upside down flat spin. If I come in violent and start reading the manual, see what I'm doing wrong. I was pulling it into a tight spin. Just let it go, it had gone right around. So that's, so that's why my first. Then one time, Joe Foss, he was a nice guy, happy-go-lucky guy. And 11th of November, which is a Marine Corps birthday, November 11th. 11th of November, 1947, here we had a guard going here. And he said, uh, I have to speak at the Marine Corps birthday up in Minneapolis. I need some support. About six or seven of you guys come along. And we'll go up and we'll have dinner and fly home. Leave here at 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock come and happy. He wasn't ready. He wasn't ready. Finally, we get off at 4 o'clock. time we get up there is 4.30. Pitch dark and they'd had an ice storm, a thick ice on the runway. Joe said, stack them, which means we're going to buzz the tower. So eight of us right like that. We buzz the tower and then we break so there's a space between each other. We all land at the same time. Joe, Joe landed here, Lloyd Olson here, and I'm here, and Bob Schmidt, he'd had a cold and hadn't flown for a couple of weeks. Anyhow, he hit that ice and he bounced, and he come right on top of me, and the propeller went through my jacket, cut off the parachute straps, sliced the jacket, went through the gas tank here, and there was no plane left. I walked out, the ambulance came out. He said, lay down, lay down. I said, I'm all right, I'm all right, all excited, I'm okay. I looked, I was covered with blood. The piece of plexiglass had, had peeled my cheek. They cleaned it up, put a band-aid on, and I went to banquet. 